a crucial difference, my understanding is, between your reading of history and those of some of your uh, new historian mm -hmm. compatriots, they have, they have a different approach to oral history and the Absolutely. use of oral history that and the validity true. thereof. And I've heard uh, you know, relatively convincing criticisms from both directions. So mm -hmm. how would you explain how you've incorporated into your own research and how you deal with the caveats that others yeah, have brought up? Absolutely. I think there are three points to be said about oral history. First of all, that's the only way that we can hear the voice of the victim, of the underprivileged, the powerless, uh, the defeated. There's no other way of hearing the voices without oral history, in modern history. So uh, that's one reason we have to use it, while being aware that memory betrays people, with all the caveats, but we cannot give it up, because that's the main voice that the people have. Even if it comes as a story that people heard from the parents, if the voices we want to hear are already gone. That's the first point. Second point is about trauma. Um, people who witnessed rape, massacre, expulsion may get the details wrong, quite possible. They may get the day wrong, they may uh, get the numbers of people who committed the crimes wrong. Uh, they may not identify correctly the weapons that were used. Absolutely. But they don't get wrong the crime. You don't get, I don't know whether you've gone into it. I, I've gone a lot into uh, the narrative of abused people. In, on every level, before I did oral history. You can't reconstruct, even for legal purposes, you cannot establish a crime of abuse without oral history. There's no documents. Rapists don't leave uh, a written document in the archive, I raped someone. And then the judge says, oh, if you don't have the document where the rapist said that he raped, I don't accept your narrative. He accepts the narrative of the victim. And I'm talking about, case, of course, the cases I was interested in were cases, historical cases. Not something that happened a week before. You right. Know? This is one of the key challenges, yeah, right? Exactly. Because people's memory... And I looked in Canada in the cases of abused children by the Catholic Church. People were sent to jail on the basis of evidence given by kids 20 years after the crimes were committed. Even when some of these bastards did not admit to what they did. Because the humanity uh, has provided us with enough mechanism to know when someone has, been go has gone through uh, a horrible event in their life. So I was not using oral history for finding out on the Palestinian side or finding out what uh, Israel did. I, I wanted to have the Palestinian voice and experience and I found many things. And of course, if you can corroborate it later with documents of the United Nations and so on, fine. So it, does that mean that you, you, you take that... Uh, Wait a minute, let me give the third please, point. Go, go ahead, see, please. It has to be completed. The third point is, I think military documents are full of lies and fabrication. I don't treat them as the truth and nothing but the truth. I think they're also... Even if they're written on the spot, people hide things. People fabricate things. So we have to be skeptical about everything, oral history, documented history. I don't think the hierarchy is that a document written by an Israeli officer has more validity than the memory of a Palestinian. They have different problems of authenticity. The one is, the caveat is memory. The other one is authenticity or, uh, or uh, truth, truthfulness. Transparency. Maybe. Transparency. I wouldn't trust any report coming from the Israeli army uh, from the West Bank today. And I would trust the Palestinian testimony of what the Israeli soldier did much more than I would trust the written report of the Israeli soldier. In fact, I would throw out to the dustbin the Israeli report. What do you say to arguments that people have uh, an inherent incentive because of this uh, clear, the, the, the intense political context? People have an incentive to exaggerate, not even exaggerate necessarily knowingly, but there's, you know, people have internal motivations to mm -hmm. to you know, play up certain elements and downplay other elements to serve what they view as, uh, as an eventual just goal. The ends justify the means in some sense. That, that doesn't tell you with, with the reality. Our biggest problem with the Palestinians was that they didn't want to talk about 48. 
like the Holocaust survivors. They didn't, people don't want to go back to a terrible thing that happened to them. We had worked very hard in convincing Palestinians to tell the story. And Israel is very amazing in this respect. And evidence of a Jewish survivor from the Holocaust is sacred. And evidence of a Palestinian survivor from a massacre is a figment of their imagination. So yet you need the same methodology. I, I put exactly that question to Benny Morris, and he said the difference in, in his mind, so I'm interested to hear what you say in response. Yeah, okay. the, the difference in his mind is that uh, the oral histories that were coming out after the Holocaust were, were almost immediate. You had people that had just experienced that, and they, they were giving statements at the time, and those were also corroborated by allied armies who, were, who saw the aftermath. And there, there were many points of corroboration, but both from the, from the individuals themselves that suffered and also from people that observed. And it was at the time, whereas now, Morris says, if you go and you interview people about something that happened decades ago, you know, you have different people that, that, have, that have come together and they've shared their stories and what you get is sort of um, almost an archetypal memory that, that describes experiences but doesn't necessarily give you any believable information about the details of what happened when to whom. Yeah. I wonder where, where he makes up these things. Most of the research, academic research on the Holocaust is based with interviews with people uh, who survive the camps and the Holocaust years after the Holocaust. I don't know why he makes it up, these things. The only place where you had some evidence, the beginning of evidence given by Jewish survivors was around the Eichmann trial, 62. I, I don't know why he makes up these things and where they come up from. I don't know. In order to, I don't know, substantiate. No, I, I don't think it's, it's a valid uh, uh, position. Uh, Time is a factor, of course, uh, and as I said, you need to know, and there's great, uh, Morris is totally innocent of any theoretical, philosophical uh, reading on history. Uh, uh, you need to read uh, Portelli and the big names of oral history. They, they guide you very well into what you can get from oral history or what you can't. So I said you can't get the details, but believe me, Someone who was abused, someone who, uh, you know, the stories of, uh, just now I was working with a, a Jordanian Palestinian director on a movie that happened in a village. Uh, her her uh, aunt, as, as a daughter, she was 12 years old, and she was locked for four days in a village without food, nearly died, and she saw through the, the uh, keyhole things that happened. In, in the village. People don't forget this. Even if you're 90, you don't forget it. I don't forget. I know the thing you do as an historian, you ask about yourself. I know the things I cannot reconstruct in my life. Believe me, the traumatic events I went through are vivid in my uh, memories if they happened yesterday. As if they happened yesterday. So I don't think that you can undermine this by, by uh, such an uh, argument. First of all, I don't think it's true. I think most of the research is based on uh, post-Holocaust uh, memories long after the event. And secondly, we are using it all over the world in order to reconstruct the history of indigenous people, of native people, with much longer uh, time. We are reconstructing the history of the American slaves with stories that were running in the families in the families, not if we don't have the eyewitnesses. We have, you know, we have diaries sometimes. Uh, we have memories that were passed from one generation to the other. Uh, it is a very important source that, of course, becomes even more valid when it is corroborated. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, if uh, a dry report by the army says, unfortunately, in the village of Ilabun, uh, some terrible, uh, uh, our soldiers committed some things that they shouldn't have done, and they don't detail it. They just say, you know, and the people of Ilabun remember exactly what these soldiers did, even 70 years after. That's a very valid thing to put in your footnote. Very valid. Uh, so I don't agree. I, I think oral history as I said, has the same problem as documented history. Um, 
Uh, Meaning it's equally problematic. Equally problematic for different reasons. For different reasons. So we as historians, we use all kinds of things. We use common sense, we use imagination. Uh, we implot, we create a narrative out of the material. And there's a great saying by E.H. Carr, who said, to compliment an historian about the facts and not about his narrative is like complimenting an architect about the material he chose, but not about the format, the form of the building. And I think that's true of the timber. So he said the quality of the timber. I remember now the quality. The quality of the timber. In other words, Facts have to be established, no doubt. You cannot invent facts, for sure. Uh, but you are allowed to use your imagination, your common sense, to create a certain narrative out of all the material that you have. What you have to do is to be very transparent. And when I reconstructed a meeting, for instance, that I think took place in the 9th of March, I didn't have the minutes of the meeting. So I wrote in a footnote. I wrote in a footnote. I think that meeting had happened in this way by the product of that meeting, the, the master document, by some reference in Ben Gurion's diary, some notes I got from interviews. But I admit, this is all I had. You, as a reader, can decide whether I went too far or not. For me, I didn't go too far. But I'm, you know, I'm absolutely open if people want to say, you know, you don't have exactly all the material about that meeting, which is true. But, uh, you know, it, to my mind, it went this way. So I didn't, for example, what I did not invent is what people said to each other. I couldn't. I said what happened in the meeting in terms of describing a general process. In terms of method, I'm curious, because yeah. it, 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 especially in, in this particular historical context, right. th there's also a language difference, right? So there's uh, the documents you're referring to are written in Hebrew. So a lot of the oral testimonies are in Arabic. So the translation process from one language to the other, do you ever encounter difficulty capturing the spirit of what's said in one language uh, rather than, rather than the, the literal uh, Not the me. Literal I, word, I, word truth? I have, or perf you have a, I have perfect command in both languages. Benny Morris doesn't know a word of Arabic. It's also a problem. It's one of the reasons he didn't use oral history. He doesn't know the language. Um, uh, no, no, I, I didn't encounter any problem there. In fact, I, I think that it's very interesting. Zionist apologetics, and Morris became one uh, recently, for what Israel did, would like to argue about the details, about the facts, about, uh, you know. Um, Palestinian historians would like to argue about the moral implication of what Israel did. Uh, and I think in the end of the day, uh, as I said, ethnic cleansing is not, a, is not allowing people to live in their homeland. You did it like this, you did it like that. We will continue to argue about that. But the Israelis will never get away with it, from it, you know? Um, and uh, I think this is where the debate has, is now, actually. Um, you mean the domestic debate? The domestic debate is about the moral issue. Because the right wing says, not only we should have kicked them out. In fact, Benny Morris says it in his new uh, dress in 48. He says, we should have, if we didn't kick them out, they would have kicked us out. That's the notion. Now, this is an argument I can accept as an entry point for a discussion. I don't accept the argument. But I can understand it. I can understand it. I can argue. But if someone says to me, because you said it was at 8 o'clock in the morning, but actually it was at 9 o'clock in the morning, and therefore it was not an ethnic cleansing, I don't have any energy to go on with it. I said, okay, I changed it to 9 o'clock. Can we now move on, you know? Uh, but of course, this is a tactic. This is a tactic to say, oh, come on, he doesn't know it was 8 o'clock, so can you trust him on ethnic cleansing issue? So I, don't, I think we, luckily for us, this, this kind of style of debate is behind us, is behind us. We are not arguing because Israel, within Israel, you're within Israel and Israel with the world, with yeah. Israel with the world. Well, well, part of one of the reasons that I've, that I've had just a personal desire to engage in this material is because I think maybe not so much for my generation, but still one generation prior, my parents' generation, what you're describing is now sort of being accepted in the Israeli domestic context and, elite, and that's where the debate has shifted, still is not. Still no, no, for them not. For, no, for that generation, because they are complicit. Your parents' generation has, is much closer to the event. 
So if I say that they were criminal, a criminal society, that it, they will defend themselves. They will find every possible way of saying, no, you're wrong. But I'm saying even in the diaspora, people are, people, like, it's, it, they seem From to a certain generation. Yeah, 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 I, I agree, I agree. But I think for the younger generation of Israelis, uh, this comes back to the present reality. Uh, if the Palestinians would continue to struggle against us, they should be warned. We can kick them out again. And we would have the right to do it. I mean, Israel is doing things which are as bad as ethnic cleansing to the Palestinians, and the Israeli society supports it fully, more than 90%. Right, which so, takes so, so it means that, let's say Israel decides to expel one million Palestinians from the West Bank. I don't know how the world will react. I, I know how the Jewish society in Israel would react. It would have no problem with that, the vast majority. There will be people who would be, have a lot of problem with it, I agree. And I think some brave Jews would come and even lie on the street, if you want, to support it. But the vast majority of Israelis would say, if the government thinks that that's the only way to stop terror and so on, unfortunately, this should be done. Which, which brings me right to the point that we should probably end on, because I yeah. think we have to go. But um, I, I don't want to, to end on sort of a cliched note. Right. You know, so how do we solve it all? How do we wrap it all up? <laughs> right. But, but what you mentioned at the beginning is some, some acknowledgment of the complicity of, if not the current generation, the previous generation, in uh, precisely what we do know now historically did happen. Where what you, can, you can argue about the, the, the morality of it, right, or the moral context. You, you seem to be arguing that, that some acknowledgement, and I imagine admission of guilt or apology would be just a, an a priori necessity to move the, the current impasse in any positive direction. How, how, do you, how do you see that as even being possible, given the context you just described, where people feel under pressure from what they regard as terrorism, from the things that, uh, that Hamas and, and you know, the open air prison that is Gaza have been saying for the past however many decades. Um, I mean, maybe there is no answer. Maybe it really is just a tragedy, right? But no, and you just have to shrug. No, 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 no. I'm an activist. I don't accept it. I don't accept it. I, I'm, I'm not an observer. I'm an activist. So from a, re from a realist... <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I have the answer to your question, of course. I'm, I've been doing it for the last 40 years. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I, I remember in South Africa, uh, visiting a few times, one, one of the things that really struck me was that uh, talking to uh, white people in South Africa who told me... This was... After, after, after apartheid. They said, they said um, we were totally convinced that apartheid was morally justified. And we were totally convinced that if we ever give up apartheid, we would be slaughtered by the Africans. And they said to me, you know, many of us still believe apartheid is better than what we have. So I said, so why are you not doing anything? They said, well, it's very interesting. They said, uh, publicly, uh, we go through a process. We go through a process. Um, first of all, we understand it's, we should say publicly that we are against apartheid. We even have to show that we were against apartheid although we were not. But as the time passes by, we really become less and less convinced that apartheid was a good idea. So it takes time. So what I'm, what I'm learning from this is to have the political process of symbolic acknowledgement, let's say. You don't need to convince every Israeli Jew to make the acknowledgement. You don't need to deprogram every Zionist. You need to find the reality by which a political leadership says, even not genuinely, for the sake of reconciliation, we are making this kind of acknowledgement, and then see how it works. Now, that's one way of doing it. The other thing that we are doing, and, and I'm, I agree, I think there are certain generations we have lost, but I think that's why the work that Zuchrot is doing and others are doing, it's education. It's education. I see my, uh, one of my, my son's uh, generation much easier to talk with them about the need to acknowledge. Much easier than with their parents. A, they don't, didn't live through that period. Uh, they have a much more universalist point of view. I'm not talking about everyone, because it's really, there's, a, there's two interesting um, uh, processes in Israel. And it would be very interesting to see how they 
uh, engage with each other. From above, the Ministry of Education, the political elite wants to create another generation of fanatic, racist, ethnic Jews. That's the program of the Israeli educational system. However, that generation is also, Israel doesn't put, for the time being, any, any uh, inhibition or restrictions on connecting through cyberspace to the rest of the world. So this is a confused generation. They have an international universal point of view and they have an educational system that wants to uh, push them in exactly the opposite direction. Exactly the opposite direction. We are using this gap to try and widen the gap, the contradiction between the Israeli education system program and our program. Let's say our, the activists. And I think we are successful, but in a very slow pace. But we, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you the truth. I think Zion, the days of Zionism or Israel as a Jewish state are numbered. Are numbered. They're, I'm not sure whether it, I hope, they're not numbered because uh, they will be defeated by the Muslim and Arab world once they get over their own problems. I, I pray to God this is not the scenario that would happen. But I think they're numbered in a different way because of the moral dimension that uh, is important to the, gener the younger generation uh, and the younger generation's reaction to the crisis like the 2008 reaction. This is what brought Jeremy Corbyn, will bring Jeremy Corbyn to the Prime Minister. It will bring Bernie Sanders and like him back to politics. This is something, this is an impulse that also exists among young people in Israel that you don't see it because here the government fights it in every possible way. That's why they're haunting uh, soldiers against silence in such a way, because they understand that, I, you know, I saw it in my uh, younger son's class. Someone came, uh, Noam came to, to, to talk to them. They loved him. He convinced them. And the teachers were- How old were these kids, just sort of curious? Uh, 17 and 18. And, and, and the, the teachers were worried. One third of my son's class did not go to the army. One third of my son's class out of 36 did not go. Now, not all of them said we're not going ideologically. Some found excuse. No, Israel. That's an unprecedented change. Yeah. No, Israel, Israel, there is this inability of us uh, as observers to understand where it's going. And I don't have a good answer for you where it's going. I don't know. But I'm an activist, so I don't care where it's going. I know what I have to do, okay? What I have to do is to say, yes, you're right. The electorate, you know, people uh, of certain age, certain generation, by the way, Sfaradi Ashkenazi, it doesn't matter, seem to like the right-wing version of Israel. They think it's working. Maybe they don't even like it, but they think it's the only thing that works because you have terror, you have Iran, you have the Arab Spring, Trump, is helping, saying, you see, we even have an American president who, who, who understands us, you know, better than this bastard Obama. Okay, but I'm saying this is one direction. There is this other direction that is not controlled. I don't know, maybe they will try and control it. But I think as activists, we should enhance it. By the way, the Palestinians have a similar problem, surprisingly. Not, again, similar problem in a different way. The old Palestinian political elite believes nationalism is the way forward. A national liberation movement, that's why many of them still support the two-state solution, said we need a nation state. You read the young people's uh, correspondence in Facebook, Twitter, they don't want a nation state. They want to live in a state that you have equal rights as citizens. They want a one democratic state. Much more, but they are not they don't want the Fatah, they don't want the Hamas, they don't want the joint uh, list. They want a world of freedom. And this is something that is, happened in the Arab world in 2011. People said to the Egyptian government, yes, you liberated us from the British, but what life do we have as a liber You liberated the land, but not the people. Now we saw how the Arab regimes reacted. I warn you that the Israeli regime can react in a similar way. I think the Palestinian regime hopefully will not react in a similar way because it's a far more complex situation. They are under occupation. But it stands to reason the third uprising would be much more against the Palestinian Authority than against Israel to begin with. So we have this 
and, and, the, and the uprising will not be to throw out the PA in order to create a state. It would to say we want, we don't like the segregate, the fragmentation of the Palestinians of different groups. We don't like the way you don't talk about the right of return anymore. We don't like the way that you say that Haifa is not part of Palestine. We want all these things. We, we need to arrest these impulses and energies to, uh, to the right agenda, which is a human rights agenda, civil rights agenda. Israel can be defeated on a human rights agenda. I don't think it can be defeated on a national right agenda anymore. It could be maybe in the 50s, 60s, I don't know, or in the 30s rather, 1930s. So, so my, my hope is that um, I, I, I'm not losing hope because I don't think politics is just politics from above. I don't think only the elites have politics and a say. So I look at Palestine from, from bottom up, I'm optimistic. I look at Palestine from above, I'm very worried, I'm frightened, I don't know what's going to happen. But as an activist, I go to the place where I'm more optimistic and I ask myself, can I enhance those forces which I think are positive? And as I say, also on the Palestinian side, not on the Jewish side. I want positive forces on the Palestinian side as well. And I think we should unite under human rights, civil rights uh, position, which Zionism is against. I think national movements as a whole are not a great idea. Uh, they, are, they, they find nationalism also would find it very difficult to respect basic human rights as a right, and we have enough examples. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere now. Uh, anyway, no, we're seeing, we're seeing it, it, now with, ironically, as you were describing the quote-unquote Muslim immigration problem. Right. In Europe, you're seeing that people are very, as soon as they're confronted with uh, having to give any small inch of their nationalist, the, the water that they swim in, so to speak, immediately people... But look what happened in England. England. Look what happened in England. What changed the, the political scene in England? You know what changed it? That a group of people between the age of 18 and 24 who never voted before decided to vote. And they voted only for one person. They didn't even vote for for one party. They voted for one person, 76 uh, years old, <laughs> interestingly enough. Why? Because the middle, and they were right, the middle ground, uh, kind of the middle-aged, if you want, do not convey authenticity. This old person who used to argue, uh, demonstrate against nuclear weapons, uh, supported the Irish struggle, comes out as an idealist. So. Uh, we never thought in Britain that the right-wing xenophobia would be met by a young, naive, if you want, not naive to my mind, by, by a young ideological response. We thought we needed as the old-timers to fight against them. There's no need for us. There's no need for us. The people in Glastonbury, two, three, I don't know if you saw it. You saw the clip with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I don't know if you saw it. Not that one, no. I'll show it to you when we finish. It's amazing. Uh, half a million people cheer him up, 76 or whatever his age is, I don't know, uh, uh, old-timer. People who came for music and fun and love treat him as a pop star. Why? Why do they? And, and all of them waving the Palestinian flag, interesting. Right, because there's something, they, they see something authentic there that they don't see elsewhere, right? And they think that Palestine, rightly or wrongly, represents this authenticity. That's where Israel has a problem. That the people who don't even know where Palestine is are waving the Palestinian flag. Because this is for them the epitome of double talk, injustice. And it's not objectively correct. I mean, there are worse place areas in the world. But that doesn't matter. Israel symbolizes for that generation everything that is wrong in it's this a world. Lightning rod. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the Israelis cannot use F-16 against this problem. They know how to deal with Terrorism, but they don't know how to, to deal with moral objection to the Jewish state. On that note, may, I don't know if this is something that, that people have, have, uh, have put to you before, but let, we can answer okay. so you have to go. But um, g given the possibility of someone like Corbyn on the horizon in, in the UK specifically, yeah, right. as you were, you were mentioning the necessity of some sort of acknowledgement, even, uh, even if it's duplicitous, some sort of acknowledgement of... Uh, of Israel's, of the previous generation of Israel's complicity in what happened at the founding of the state. Is there not something to be said for the fact that 
the the imperial powers themselves, like England, have yet to apologize, oh. let alone for their global colonial project, uh, but specifically for for their role in in, in the, the completely paradoxical promises they made to both sides. Would that not be just a simple low hanging fruit for someone like a Corbyn to come forward and say? we apologize for the role we played in, in raising false promises? Why do you think the Jewish lobby tried to hunt him down, as Al Jazeera showed in the brilliant film, uh, The Lobby? Why do you think the Isra Israeli and Jewish lobby is working against uh, Corby? Because do, he, do you think he would make that apology? Of course. I, I, I'm sure that uh, when the Balfour Declaration would be commemorated and Theresa May would say, we're so happy we gave the Balfour Declaration, Jeremy would come to our meeting in the Palestine Solidarity Committee. I have no doubt about it. He would come to lament the Balfour Declaration. He would play it carefully. He's a politician. He would say Israel is an established fact. We should recognize the Jewish state. But yes, he would, he would definitely acknowledge that Britain had a very important role. He already did it. It's, it's not just the Balfour Declaration. No, no, no. In my mind anyway, because they were literally the different wings of the foreign absolutely. service making different promises. Absolutely, different absolutely. He, he, Corbyn would have no problem in acknowledging it, really. Uh, I don't want to speak in his name, uh, but I, I worked with him in the Solidarity Movement definitely until this time, moment in time. This is his position. You ask me. It's, it's very hard for me to imagine an Israeli, anyone in Israeli leadership, even rising to a position of prominence, who would be willing to do that if the example is not set by spy. Uh, well, I, I don't know. At least a little less to lose. I don't. I don't think. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think what forces what would force Israel to make the apologies if the alternative would be worse. I think, unfortunately, Israel understands only the language of power. But uh, would an example help? Yeah, it will help. It will help. It will definitely help. And then maybe it's easier to get it out of Britain than to get it from Israel to, to begin with. Yeah, I think so. There's a huge campaign called the Balfour Project that uh, millions of British have enlisted to. They want to have a de very different commemoration in the 2nd of November 1917. But e even that, couldn't that be construed as, uh, as inherently pro-Palestinian by, by the people on the Israeli side? Whereas if you just if there's an apology just for the role of, Brit of Britain... Yeah, uh, yeah, I understand British what you're that, saying. That should be easier for the British to yes, do it. Exactly. it I, th I, think, uh, I think that's possible. Well, that, that's, that's possible. I'm, I'm, you, I'm, less, I'm less, I'm less uh, optimistic than you are that this would be such a big impact on the Israelis it's themselves. Are I think, you a UK citizen? I'm, I'm just curious. I know, I'm not, oh, I'm not, I'm not. But regardless, you, you have some, some sway there. I, I have, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. But uh, I, 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 I'm really worried by the way that the British government is going to celebrate Balfour. That's for me is a bit too much. Let alone, don't do anything. Okay, so just say, say 100 years ago we gave the declaration, but they are going, Israel, uh, Theresa May is going to come to the Israeli embassy, someone from the royal family is going to come to the Israeli embassy. I mean, they're going to say Britain gave the world something beautiful, which is called the Balfour Declaration, and that's, that's bad. And that's why I think the only thing you can do for the time being is to have a counter event, just to mention. But I agree with you, yeah, I, I think it is. All in all, I think it's very good for both the Israelis and the Palestinians to know that they are not exceptional in what they did to each other and what they experienced. Precisely. Actually, you could contextualize it. Uh, uh, I just think that the Palestinians have far more readiness to accept it than the Israelis do. Anyway, Thank I think so we should do that. Here, Jonathan.